Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, sorry there, Mr. Schwartz. Give me a second here. I'm trying to get the uh, audio working and the. That's okay. I'm not getting it working either yet. Hold oh, on. I, I'm sorry. Not hearing you yet. Give me one second. Oh, no. Did we have this problem last time too with the? Oh, I know what it was. I need the speakers off. Is it short or short? I'm sorry. Is it short? Short. Short. I can hear me. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm. He's. I'm sorry. You're talking here. I'm. I'm. I'm unfortunately not hearing you yet. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, wait. I'll put it in the chat box. Uh, he can't even see us yet. What's going on here? Um. Oh, I know what it is. Now I can see. There we go. Can you see me? And. We can see you, but I am still figuring out the audio here because, yeah. Do I need to have the, the monitor down, you think? Maybe I think that might have been part of it. Do you have, are you getting an echo? Yep. Yeah, of course. Okay, um, Mr. Schwartz, uh, do you mind doing a sound check for us here real quick? No, not at all. Uh oh, <laughs> still not working. Okay. Yeah, I have probably a really good question. I'm gonna ask about Facebook. Just give me one second. That little bit. No you don't problem. Mind. Um, anyone have any thoughts on why this audio might not be working? So it's a, it's a connection problem, right? So many people for that. Try to let's see here. I am you I, now. I'm hearing you now. You are uh, okay. One second. Hi, this is Neil. I am in Boca Raton, Florida, where we just got a lot of rain and wind, but luckily we didn't get what they got up in the um, central part of Florida, where they're just digging out from Hurricane Ian. Yes, mm. yes. Glad to hear that you're okay, Mr. Schwartz. Sorry for not asking about your situation yesterday. I realized that it was uh, making landfall very near you. Can you see us all okay? We got you kind of situated, everyone coiled around. Dominic, see Dominic, you might want to switch over to maybe this seat here, if you wouldn't mind. And then we can get everyone in the shot. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Sports, for being here. It's uh, my pleasure. I uh, had a nice long talk with your professor yesterday. He told me that you've all got some questions prepared. Mm -hmm. um, that's good. I What I like to do is spend maybe the first five to eight minutes, maybe five, five to ten minutes, kicking off a few things. And then I'd love to get to your questions. Uh, so, and then, and then after that, what we can do is, you know, we can always review or even create some new questions, which actually really is what the critical thinking does. It creates new questions, but those questions really help to guide you, you know, with your project and with what you're just trying to do. So what I'm going to do right now is I want to share a couple of different things here. And hopefully you'll see them on the screen at this early in the morning. How are we doing? Are we getting it? Yes, we got it. Okay, awesome. So I uh, really, um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to remind everybody of a few things. Number one is actually, I wanna make you guys bigger so I can see you a little better. Yeah, I'm still waking up here. So just remember where all the data is coming from always very important to make sure that the methodology is you know front and center with as you start to work and as you start to present uh, most of the data that you're going to be working with comes from our annual proprietary study of sports fans we've been doing it since 2017 um, it's conducted in first quarter of um, every year looks back at the trailing 12 month period but also looks ahead at the future 12 months and that can be kind of fun because you can see if if past performance is going to be indicative of future performance. Um, we utilized a sample of over five to 6,000. This year it was like 6,400 people, persons 13 years and older. That's the oldest, by the way, that the law will allow us to be able to do um, any sort of survey um, without necessarily getting parents' permission. Um, it uses internet sampling methodology, very well time tested. Collections balanced against the U.S. population based on age, income, gender, household size, geographic region, race, and ethnicity. And the reason why we do that is that we want our collection to resemble 
the United States, the 278 million people who are 13 years and older across this great country of ours. So we're essentially building a model and then building our sample through the model. And also we're a single source data collection. So we're not bringing in data from the NFL. I'm not bringing data in from anywhere else. Everything you see here is coming right from the survey instrument. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process. And I'm hoping that what we're going to do is the questions will, I'm, you know, will relate to this process. And if they don't, I'm going to make my answers relate to the process. So it's very important. And, and I talked to uh, Professor Bishop about this yesterday is that in the very beginning, you've got to fill that information funnel. Information is not just data. Information is a combination of a lot of things. It's articles, which you can get, of course, on my site. You can get them on Google, scientific publishing. Most professors have done a lot of publishing on many of the topics that you know are going to be talked about. Great place to find out what the experts had to say. In a lot of cases, these articles are old, so they may or may not be as relevant today as they were, let's say, in, I don't know, 2018, 2017, 2013, but they may give you some, you know, background. They may give you a, a, a data point that you can use. Of course, there's data. And that's where I hope that, you know, you'll be on my site accessing data. And we'll talk about that as we go today. And, and also, by the way, I'm not the only place to get data from. You can get it in other places, you know. I don't know if you've been like at fondstatista.com or um, there's other data available. Oh, you're data all over the place. Um, you can get it even if you go to the NFL.com, they'll point you to a lot of their own data. But also qualitative. Qualitative in many ways can be underrated, but it's really important. I'll give a quick example. I'm working for one of the leading uh, online uh, sports gambling platforms, and I, uh, we're doing, I'm working on a, a, a project for them via one of the schools that we subscribe to. And I had an interview with one of their marketing people, one of their senior marketing people, and we talked a little bit about what it is they're trying to do what's, and all that. And I learned something that I never knew. And I took what I never knew and incorporated that into my process. One data point, one piece of information, but I incorporated it into my thinking as I'm developing my strategy and also my final presentation. So it's all about pulling in as much as you can into the funnel. But in the beginning, the kinds of things you want to do is identify. You want to identify current situation. What's going on out there? Goals and objectives. What do you want to accomplish? You know, possible hurdles and challenges. You know, if you're talking about gambling, one personal hur hurdle or challenge is, one, does the state I live in have even online gambling? Or does the state that I want to talk about have online gambling? But if you're still doing online gambling, one of the problems is people say that there's a lot of underage online gambling. Fact is, I don't know if there's a lot, but there are 1.7 approximately people under the age of 21 that are in fact gambling via online sports gambling platforms. You know, um, we can talk about whether that's a problem or not, but again, that's a hurdle. So you want to understand the hurdle. It's important to know what victory looks like. How am I going to keep score? What's going to be the important numbers that are going to let me know what victory looks like? And the other thing I like to stress is benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. Is what I am looking to accomplish, am I doing better than the average or worse than the average? If I'm doing better, yay. If I'm doing worse, that can be either yay or nay. But at least you have, you know, if you don't know where you are, it's very hard to judge where you're going to end up. And that's, you know, what I talk about by benchmarking. Look, you all have GPS on your phones. You use it to find a local Starbucks, a gas station, a restaurant, really anything. So you know where the final destination is, but they're going to give you multiple routes to get there. All roads, no toll roads, um, divided highways, no divided highways, you know, traffic problems, no traffic problems. So you want to be able to make sure that you use the best route and benchmark that against other possibilities. When you're filling that funnel, you also want to look for the things like targets. 
Now, I know speaking from to Professor Bishop yesterday, that you guys are working, I believe, uh, Professor Bishop, with the AFC and the NFC. Is that correct? Yes. So we're divided into AFC and NFC groups and trying to identify the best division. And then okay. maybe two teams within each conference that we can target for the cheesesteak uh, advertising. Got it. So again, it becomes, you know, what benchmarks do we want to look at for both the AFC and the NFC? What are the important measurements? But remember benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. So what you would do to benchmark this is look at the AFC against the total league. Look at the AFC against the NFC. So you want to establish certain benchmarks. You know, how will what will fans do with respect to the specific challenge or the objective? Again, compare to the benchmarks. You know, we're setting up this cheesesteak restaurant, so we might want to look at some of the fast food data, you know, or casual. I think we call it fast casual, actually. We don't call it fast food anymore. So we might want to look at fast casual dining to see, you know, what are people doing in that area? You always want to divide and conquer. Okay, what's important, what's not? You don't want to clutter up your decision process. You don't want to clutter up what you're doing with data that's not important. I find a lot of times people will just love to throw lots out there and hope that what they're throwing up on the wall actually sticks. That's not the way you want to go here. What teams are even better? You may want to even profile or go a little deeper than just your league. Um, you know, I love doing a segmentation. That may be a little bit, you know, more for your next course or the one after that, but we can talk about that if you want to. Um, you know, narrow down. I like to use what I call the best, better, good format for things. It used to be known as good, better, best, but I call it best, better, good. Who are my number one targets? Who are my secondary targets? And then who are my tertiary targets? Again, data, really the only way to find that out. And then the last point is you want to activate. How am I going to activate with these particular clients? How am I going to hit my targets? And then what is more important? Do I want just the number of people or do I want to look at engagement? And we can talk a little bit about that because they're both important, but some are more important than others. You know, do I want to look at traditional media, TV, streaming, social media, you know? We've talked a lot about, I, I've written a lot about, by the way, lately, the Amazon deal at the NFL. Um, you know, I'm going to stand by my projection that I think in the short term, they're going to have some issues uh, maintaining audience on Amazon. But I think that once they get over the hurdle, once they get consumers used to finding Thursday night football on Amazon, I don't think they're going to have an ongoing problem. But I do think in the short term. So a short term problem for them means if they can't deliver the same fan number that they promised, you know, they're going to have to make good on those promises. It just doesn't like, oh, sorry, we effed up. We misjudged. No, it doesn't like, it does not work like that. Neil, uh, so, if you don't mind, uh, just because I am excited about the Dolphins Bengals game tonight, which I. Me too, uh, me too, by the way. It's here, here. And I, I hope that it's still going to happen as a Bengals fan. I'm excited to see it. Um, I, I read that uh, Amazon bought the rights for Thursday Night Football for around a billion dollars through, I think, yeah. 2033 or so. Yes. But using that as an example, what are some of the benchmarks you think they're looking at right now in the short term? And how are they going to measure the, the longer term success just to maybe give some context to the class? Sure, let me open up something just to kind of do that thing here. So, you know, right now we're looking at the uh, NFL football uh, spreadsheet that I think everybody had access, has access to. Yep. So what I did was I went and looked at the NFL, NFL fans and I went and looked at streaming. So I went and looked at first, I looked at the percentages of people that are doing streaming and how many games they actually streamed. And I went and looked at, you know, different data points. I went and looked at different aspects of it. But what I went to is I went right to streaming. I know I'm a bad boy. I'm not supposed to always do that, but I did it. And I understood that there's a total of 9 million. Now, remember what I said earlier in this conversation, benchmark. I know that there are 9 million. Oops, I did some. Oh, yeah, I didn't do that right. There are 9 million, uh, yes, 9,386,000 people currently streaming NFL football. 
And then I look to see, okay, approximately 23.5%. Because what we're doing here is we're looking at what they call vertical percent. Vertical percent is always the first percentage when we're looking here. So this would be 23.5% of the 99.3 million are actually, actually did I do that right? No, I did not. Yeah, it's, it's actually two percentages here. The first one is 21% of all NFL fans stream. Number two is that 23.5% of them have been streaming for one year or less. The vertical percent breaks it down this way. So we're always, I'm horizontal, I'm sorry. So we're always looking to benchmark. So in this case, here's our benchmark. And if somebody wants to write it down for me, that'd be cool. But right now, the average benchmark, 21.4% are in fact streaming. And then that's about 9.3 million fans. I just wrote that down, by the way, on my notepad. So now what do I want to do? Now I want to scroll down a little bit further. And I'm going to show you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go over to contents and I'm going, going to go look at what streaming services they currently subscribe to. So I'm going to look for the Amazoners. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, um, you know, then I'm going to look at what services people are planning to subscribe to. So we know for instance, oh, oops, just drop my pen. So we already know that 6.1 million, I'm sorry, I got the number. I'm sorry, 6 million fans are already streaming or already have Amazon Prime. So 6 million of that total 9.3 million that we talked about. And their percentage, though, is much higher. 64.9% of, of the people that do have Amazon Prime do stream games. Do they stream one? Do they stream two to five? Or do they stream six? This is important. And I'm going to tell you why. This is important because this tells me, are people just watching their own team? Like, like Professor Bishop and I are going to do. By the way, I'm a Dolphin fan. Uh, I'll be watching tonight. I hope uh, Tua is going to play. Um, I'm scared. Here, I, I think the, Beng uh, the Bengals are in real trouble. Man, <laughs> I'm, I'm smelling a bet. Guys, I'm smelling a bet here. So uh, <laughs> maybe we'll do some inter-client gambling. Um, but again, what you want to be able to do is you want to use the data that we present to you in the best way possible. What I also looked at, for instance, in, you know, where are people gambling? I'm sorry, where are people watching it? And then how are they doing it? And I'm going to go back to one more thing. And that is this. Um, you know, which devices are they watching? Are they watching on their computers? Are they watching on a tablet, smartphone? How are people watching? That's really important also. So it's really all about streaming services added in the past year, which is very important, and then streaming services they already had. You could add these two numbers up, by the way, and get the number you need for total number of streamers. And you can do this, by the way, in a trended format. You don't maybe probably need to want to go back too far, but you can go back, let's say, 2020 to 2021. You can go back 2019 to 2020 to 2021. You can do a lot of different things. But that's what I would do with respect to looking at that particular uh, scenario. So what I'd like to do now is to kind of move this over to you guys. And I don't know who wants to jump in first with your questions, but I am uh, anxious to hear them. So who's going first, Dr. B? Well, uh, if I will throw it out there too. I, I think you know, we're evaluating whether or not Prime Video is going to be successful with these games. Next year's data is going to be very, very important in trying to evaluate yes. that too. So obviously, yes. this is this is always an ongoing process, and really, the data analysis, the data collection, and data analysis process never ends. Right? It's just keeps keeps getting better, keeps getting refined. So um, I know that most of the the students here have got a question or two. I, I think. Whoever is ready to start can go ahead. What do you what do you I'm ready? What do you think? Don't keep too shy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm at, if I don't hear from that. Yeah, yeah, whatever question you'd like to ask. You can hear me? 
Yes. Hello? Oh, my bad. All right, so back to the very first slide. Wait, DJ, can you go back to the first slide? I can. Add up? I, I can. The, the one where it said, like, because it says something about, like, they targeted this, like, a kind of, like, area. Kind of. What do you mean? This one or that one? Um, or just okay. this one or the data itself? Yeah, that, that one, that one. No, no, go back, go back. Right methodology one, yes. Yeah, because right here it's saying they, they, um, they reach out age, income, gender, household size. So speaking of household size and income, right, do you, like, what, what kind of effect do you think that play? Because I feel like it got a big impact because, like, based on the household size and income, I feel like it'll tell you how much money a, um, a family is willing to spend. So it's like a sports organization and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? If it's a family struggling, they probably don't really have much money to stay compared to a family that's like that's financially stable. So like that's why when he's saying target the family based on household size and income, I feel like that's like a really smart idea. Like, like what you think the reason behind that? Like how you think that the household size got an um, impact on it? Well, I want to come back to your what's your first name? It's no, it's the Will Tate. Will Taylor well, Robinson. I'm from Tampa, Florida. I, 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 oh, you are? Everything okay up? Are your parents okay? Your family okay? Oh, they're in Alabama right now. Okay, well, that, I got news for you. That's where it's headed next. Dang. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a big business. storm. Yeah. I had some friends of mine that were in New Orleans. They got out yesterday also. So, what, how do you say it? Is it Will or Will Tay? You call me Will Tay, I take for short. Okay, I got you, Tay. I'm writing that down because. You know, I want to be able to reference it when I send over some notes. But look, I, I'll be honest, household income is really one of those data points, whoops, one of those uh, data points, whoops, again, that comes into almost everything. Everything almost has an element of household income. And the reason I say that is because, let's face it, people that have a lot of money or a lot of discretionary income you know, are able to do more, you know, in terms of, you know, what they have to spend on different things. Right. So I always like the idea of making sure to focus in. I mean, if we look here, first of all, we know that I'm going to do my own little uh, thing here so we can see it. So we know that there are 143 million NFL fans nationwide. We know how they break down by gender. We know how they break down uh, by age. We know, but one of the things that are really important is household income. So it's very important to know that interesting thing is the largest um, percent of people that are NFL fans, the large are people that make over a hundred thousand dollars a year or have a household income of over a thousand dollars a year. So, you know, it would be interesting to maybe find out who are those people. So you go to this line down here. And you start looking and understanding where are they located? Well, we know by census, I'm going to actually pull this over a little bit, if you don't mind. I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to go all the way to the right, because I've actually got it divided by the nine census regions here. So, you know, we may want to look and see, okay, how are the numbers divided in terms of the census region? If I'm working, let's say, with NFC teams, you know, I might want to focus differently than, let's say, if I'm working with AFC teams or a specific team. So as an example, you know, I, I, you, know you, you, you can look up West, North, Central census region. You know, you might see that, you know what, that's a fairly small number in the East, Northeast South Central, also very small. So again, you want to be able to draw those comparisons and you want to be able to do those benchmarks. You know, you want to look, I love, by the way, I love working with generational age as well as income. So they're right next to one another. So I would definitely look at that. You know, you could obviously education is always interesting, you know, attended and then watched, you know, would be your two biggest numbers. I mean, you've got 15 million people attended, of which 6.6 .6 million are, you know, have household income of over 100K. So you always, again, want to benchmark. But I do believe, just like you say, that household income is a really important determining factor. 
and especially when we're trying to sell Lexuses or something like that, right? Uh, you know, we want to target those hundred thousand plus earners for those luxury goods. Whereas if we're talking about fast casual dining, even people that are earning less money are still going to be able to afford those products. So you know, that's, that's actually, and actually in some ways, you know, fast casual dining, you know, is a really good category for really all income levels. Um, uh, called quick service sure. restaurants. So, you know, I have this up on the screen. So the interesting thing about this is, and I'm going to scroll back to our income question. Here we go. So what do we know here? So let's just do this. Do, 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 do. Okay, we know our 143, we know that there's 143 million NFL fans nationwide. And what do we know? We also know that there are approximately 50 million of them that have a household income of, so, you know, you're looking at about 35%. But now what you're doing is you start looking at, you know, fast casual dining. And what do we see? Well, we see that if you look for, let's say, Wendy's, you know, 29% of Wendy NFL fans that are also inclined to use Wendy's, you know, make a little bit less. You know, they're 50K to, um, you know, they're 50K to um, 99K. Or you could start adding, let's say, these together or these together. So the idea is that the data will kind of take you in a different direction depending on what specific category you are talking about. Good job. I'll tell you, that's a good kickoff. I appreciate it. Um, but good question. Household income really does matter. Um, great job, man. And the next extension of that too, real quick, I'm sorry, Nelson, I know you're ready to go. But the next extension of that too for household size, right, is the bigger the household size, the more family members need to be taken care of. So if we have a yes. one person <laughs> household that's making 100,000 more, they have less expenses uh yes most likely and of course you want to double check that data and make sure that you're not allowing your preconceived notions or biases entering into that but that's where the household size comes into it right as a i again this is the, this is me looking at my own situation and so you don't want to use that as a way to globalize information but i am a household size of one so I have a lot more discretionary income because I am not paying for childcare and, and extra costs and things like that. So I'm a good target for NFL because I am, I'm watching through streaming. I am attending games. I am influenced by their advertising. And so that's what we're trying to substantiate with the data there. And again, be careful with those exceptions, but that's the household. Yes. The thing is, all, all, just to follow up on Professor Bishop for a second, um, this is why age and generational age can be really important. Look, we know the Gen Zs, you know, people that are 13 to 24 year olds aren't having kids. They don't have them now, most likely. Of course, there's going to be some exceptions. And yesterday, by the way, this brings up another point. When we're looking at data, you want to look at the rule, not the outlier. There are always going to be outliers. That's one of the reasons why when we're, you know, statisticians or data people like me love to talk about averages. So, you know, we talk about average versus the outlier. Don't get hung up on one or two outliers. You know, oh, a friend of mine's, you know, 24 years old or 22 years old, they have a kid already. You're right. There's going to be plenty of outliers, but the rule is what we want to shoot for and not the outliers. I'm not saying that outliers are not important, but you want to, you know, my dad used to taught me this expression. I've used it a lot in life. You want to go fishing where the fish are. So would you rather go fishing where there are a million fish or would you rather go fishing where there are 50 fish or 100 yeah. fish or 1,000 fish? Oh my gosh, I feel that. Good. Hey, next, uh, gentleman in front, I think, was uh, had a question. I think we, Nelson might have been ready, or, or don't matter. Sorry. Uh, no. uh, like, I was wondering, like, say that you were to have a theory, or like you had a scenario and you were to, like, you had a couple teams or a couple ideas in mind, would you consider like getting outside information, or would you consider trying to tie in another data point or something else to make that to like final decision? on the data point? That's an interesting question. 
Okay, that's a really interesting question because there are really three answers to that. When it comes to data as a general rule, yes, more is better. And that means, you know, you go looking for other sources of data. You know, if you're going to be doing data, you know, on the NFL specifically, you know, you might want to go to NFL.com or you might want to go to, let's say, another, um, you know, another source to look for data. I only caveat you this. There's a lot of good data and there's a lot of bad data. It's very difficult sometimes for somebody that's kind of new to the data world to understand the difference. The data I bring to you has been vetted, tested, and back tested. And we've been doing it for a long time. So I feel pretty confident about our data. But if somebody brings to me some data with, let's say, you know, a smaller sample size, and remember, how many NFL, how many NFL teams are there, Nelson, just real quickly? 32. 30, 32 or 33, I believe. Um, I think there's an odd, odd Isn't there 33? Uh, maybe there's 32. That's 32. Know. Okay, I got it wrong. Give me a break. I haven't had enough coffee yet. But uh, <laughs> or if I had any. Okay, so here's the thing. If you've got 32 teams and you're using a sample size of, let's say, I don't know, let's say 3,200, right? So in theory, that means there are only 100 responses for each one of those teams, right? Yes, sir. As you start to go down and look at, let's say, household income, you know, 20%, let's say, make, you know, I'm just using this number arbitrarily here. But if 20%, let's say, are 50,000 income or above, you know, you're starting to slice that sample up pretty thinly. Okay, so, you know, the bigger... As a general rule, larger numbers work better. There's this thing, and I don't want to get into science, but there, and uh, maybe Professor Bishop will, but there's this thing called the law of large numbers. But there's also, you know, the law of small numbers. Small numbers are just not reliable. They wobble. They can be a little bit um, subjected to what we call survey bias. Um, and, you know, again, smaller numbers can move a lot easier. So, you know, Nelson, it's really important when you're bringing in other data that you may or may not be that familiar with, it's very important to know where the data is coming from, how many years of data do they have, what sort of testing or back testing have they done, and then here's my favorite thing, match it up to some other known data sources, you know, match it up to mine. You know, I looked at something the other day, um, you know, it said, I don't remember what it was, but it said like, you know, there was, you know, 6.5 million up 12% from the previous year. Well, we had like 7.5 million, but it was up 10%. So how would you interpret that particular statistic, Nelson, just out of curiosity? I'm sorry, just to clarify, it was Dominic that asked that question. Oh, I'm sorry, Dominic. I, I, I muddled it up because I mentioned Nelson's name. My, my no, you're fine. It's my fault, too. I didn't repeat that. <laughs> Can you repeat that again, please? Sorry, my bad. Sure. So if I, so let's say my data says that there are 7.5 million people that, I don't know, let's say subscribe to Amazon. Mm -hmm. But I looked at somebody else's somebody else's data and it showed that 6.5 million subscribed to Amazon. But in both cases, when I look at the trend of growth, they showed that it was growing at around 10% a year, and I showed they're growing at 12% a year. What's the most important number to you that would give you, let's say, a little bit of confidence in the data? I'd say the one growing at the 12% rate. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Because you always want to, you know, look, whether it's seven and a half million or six and a half million, that's not really the most important point here. The most important point is that the trends, the direction, is it going up or down at the same rate or close? And that's what you want to look at. If, if their data shows that they're going up 10%, and my data shows that they're going down 10%, well, then Houston, we have a problem, one way or the other. So you 
always want to look to determine, you know, both the, what I like to call tonnage, 12 million versus 10 million, or trendage, percentage up, percentage down. But Dominic, I think that's a really good question and a really good point. Thank you. Maybe now, no. Yeah. Um, so I saw that there's like a, there's some statistics on there that show like people's favorite like college team or soccer team. I just want to know like what the relationship between that and like people's favorite NFL team, like how do they correlate? A good question. Well, I have given you access to something and I sent it to, over to Dr. Bishop last night. I have given you access to this data file that you see up on the screen right now. Okay. You don't pay for this, but I like Dr. Bishop. So I've already given you access to it. And also I like the, I like, you know, I love working with your school. So I've given you access to the data. So when you say correlation, that's a dangerous word in this case. And I'm going to tell you why. Because let's go and look at NFL football for a change. So we know there are 143 million NFL fans. And let's use a city like, I don't know. Let's see what, let's use New York. Okay. Now in New York, they're dominated, of course, by the stinking New York Jets. That's just my own editorial comment, by the way. And the New York Giants. Uh, they they gave the Bengals a win. <laughs> I'm from Philadelphia originally. So I, I have in my DNA, I hate the Giants. I hate the Jets. I pretty much hate every New York team except for Syracuse where I went to school. But so what you want to do is you have to be real careful. Because when you start to look at regional and college you know, there's 6.4 million New York Giants fans, two point, let's go round up, to 2.6 million Jets fans. Well, you know what? The University of Texas at Austin has among the largest fan base in the United States. They don't have squat when it comes to Jets fans. You know, they have, you know, Duke has some fans. University of Michigan, Jets fans don't have squat when it comes to um, – you know, the University of Michigan. You know, let's see if I can go down to my school if it's here at all. Oh, please be, please be, please be. Looks like Syracuse doesn't, looks like Syracuse isn't even here. Hold on. Dang. Let me get it. Let's see here. Looks like I'm going to get, wait, no. Wait, 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 wait. It looks like not. I told Professor Bishop, where'd you go to school? Where, where'd you go to undergrad? Uh, I went to Ohio State. Oh, how I... I'm pretty Ohio sure State. they are in there. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in that, too. Yeah, you Ohio know, State. Like University of Oregon. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pander to the uh, professor for a minute. All right. Let's, uh, let, let's, uh, let's, let me uh, go to him. I'm sure they're here somewhere. They were, they were at the top. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. That's where they well, the interesting be. thing is, okay, so now we go to the Jets. So we know, for instance, that the Jets have a total of 2.5 million fans, of which approximately 19,000 of them are fans of the Ohio State University, and Giant fans are 90,000 of them are fans of the Ohio State University. So again, you know, depending on which school you have to be careful because there's some, there is generally going to be some sort of regional bias on that. But I can also tell you that certain schools overcome the regional bias. Certain school like Ohio State, or as much as it pains me to say it, <laughs> University of Michigan to a lesser extent, Notre Dame. Notre Dame has fans everywhere. Um, Stanford, fans everywhere. Boston College, fans everywhere. Um, so it's really important, I think, to understand. You now, make sure, uh, who, who was the gentleman that talked about the regional, what was the gentleman's name? Uh, Nelson. Uh, Nelson asked the question. Nelson, was there a specific team you wanted to just out of curiosity look at? Or a specific scenario no. that you wanted to look at? No, there isn't really anything specific. I just wanted to know. 
Look, I think it is. I think there can be a lot of validity. You know why? That remember I used the expression a little about well, and I said go fishing where the fish are. Yeah. You never know where the fish are going to be. You might be able to find ninety thousand Giants fans, you know, amongst Ohio State University fans. So you know, you might be able to, I don't know, maybe find a specific influencer. Um, that is a Jet fan that also went to Ohio State that maybe can be your social media pivot point, so to speak, or your social media person. And we're going to, by the way, talk about that at some point, I hope. But again, you never know where you're going to find, you know, that, you know, where you're going to find the fish. So keep an open mind and determine, is it, you know, is it going to be worth you know, there's an expression, I don't know, there, from this uh, movie, I forgot what it is, I think it's the, uh, the girl next door or something like that, where the guy says, the bad guy says, is the juice worth the squeeze? Well, I've seen that, I remember. <laughs> okay, so you have to determine, is the juice going to be worth the squeeze, and is the effort going to be worth the results? It may not. It may not. So again, very important for you to be able to you know, see, look, here's an example. Philadelphia Eagles have, have 4.9, let's say 5 million fans nationwide. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia. That actually does my heart good. But look at this. They've got 1.5 million of them are also fans of Penn State. That's a pretty significant number. In fact, 31.5% or 31.1% of Eagles fans went to Penn State. Nobody. I don't know. That's a big number. So, you know, if I'm going to try to do something for the Eagles, I might want to look at Penn State fans. I'm willing to bet you a dozen donuts that the Philadelphia Eagles do nothing with Penn State. Nothing. They don't work with the Penn State Booster Club. They probably don't work with the school itself. But you never know where you're going to find the fish. So just keep an open mind and ask oh. questions. So it's a great question, you know, if you don't mind just to build off that a little bit. So, you know, from an activation standpoint, right, what do we do with that is the next step. And so perhaps there are some players that played for the Eagles that also went to Penn State that we could then target and say, hey, can you be a brand sponsor for us? Can you be an influencer? What do you think about partnering with a various team or something like that? So, so that's what we do with the data. We recognize, hey, we've got this big, massive chunk of giant of, of Eagles fans that are also Penn State fans, let's tie it all together and figure out a way where we can advertise and kind of target that, that big chunk of people by saying, hey, um, you know, bring your, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, bring your, wear a Penn State shirt to a game and get a free beer or something like that, right? That, that could work as a way to kind of market to that group and maybe influence the way they're, they're purchasing. Here's an interesting way to do it also. And by the way, Professor Bishop, thank you. That's the perfect. That was the exact right answer. But of course, I didn't get to where I wanted to get to here. So, um, you know, one of the other places you can go for activation right now is always social media. You know, always you can find out which social media platforms. In this case, I'm looking at, the hell am I looking at here? Uh, this is Twitter. So again, you know, you can line up all of your social media platforms and determine which ones are going to be the best. You know, so you want to look at the combination of things. One, you want to look at the combination of volume. Is there enough volume there, enough fish? But then what's the percentage? You know, are there more Twitter fans that are Philadelphia Eagles fans that maybe also follow Penn State? You want to look at that. You know, one of the things I did last night that was interesting when I looked at this sports gambling situation is, you know, when you're looking at sports gambling, let's say, and you want to target um, higher income households, guess what? TikTok is not going to be the preferred, let's say, social media platform for those people. But if you look at all NFL fans, man, TikTok is just getting it done. It has the largest year over year growth in terms of fans, and it is right up there with Instagram. So what you want to do is but you want to make sure that when you activate, you activate in the right place. The juice has to be worth the squeeze.
we'll take go ahead if we got something you want to ask. Who's next? Oh, my bad. I just seen that. One thing I would say, like, I don't know if you already doing this, but what one thing I noticed is like you gotta do, you gotta work with the generation, you know, like you know, like when you attract fans, you know, you gotta do like what is the new generation interest and like what stuff they like. One thing, like okay, nowadays people love being on TikTok, you know, like Snapchat more, Instagram more, because Facebook more of an older generation thing, you get know what I'm saying? But like the younger people, they tend to be on like different stuff. You know, you know, wait, 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 stop. You don't have to you don't have to clarify that we're all good people and all. You don't have to just you know just say what you want to say. In general, just say what you want to say. Oh, uh, what I was saying is like do do the way you operate, do you do like based off like what's going on in today's world, like instead of doing the same thing over and over again, like do you do you evolve like yearly, like based off like what people into that year? Well, the answer is absolutely. And okay, I, I see you now. I'm, pr I'm proud of you. There you go. <laughs> go out here. The answer is absolutely. But the interesting thing here is let's let's look at something. So we know that there are a total of, as I remember correctly, 143 million NFL fans. And you know, we can compare, let's say, Twitter versus Facebook. You know, and here's the interesting number. So if we look at those, let's say that post one to three, let's do daily. I don't like that number. Let's do the number of people who post one to three times a, a week on Twitter. One to three days a week. Yeah, okay. You know, if we look at the 50,000 number, you know, Facebook has a much larger number. In fact, almost a lot more. I'd say what, 50% more if I'm doing my math correctly. So again, you want to be able to really, again, isolate. You want to narrow down your targets as best you can. That was uh, Tay, right? You already know what it is. What we'll well, take. You know, I, I wrote it down, dude. I mean, I'm, I know I'm old, but, you know, I do know, you know, I do know I I've learned a few now. things. <laughs> I know. Look, I know I'm old. I've learned a few things, though, over my, uh, I don't even want to say how old I am. But I guess the point I'm saying is you want to try to narrow things down as best you can. How many of you heard the term niche, N-I-C-H-E, or niche, niche marketing, or niche marketing, niche marketing? How many of you have heard it? Okay, everywhere you go, everybody I have a conversation with, they use the word niche. And what is a niche? A niche is a smaller group, a smaller area, a better defined smaller group. That's what people are looking for. They're not looking for, you know, people aren't, you know, carpet bombing, you know, media anymore in order to be able to find, let's say, a specific group of customers. You can't carpet bomb in terms of advertising. And when I say carpet bomb, you know, that's why network TV advertising has dropped so significantly because they are the carpet bomb. They just lay down their, you know, they lay down their ads and hope that it hits the right people. Um, you know, I can tell you that the, the more targeted ads, you know, that are directed, you know, a little bit more towards me tend to be the ones that, are more effective with me. You know, I don't pay attention to a lot of the ads, unfortunately, on network TV. I don't, you know, I have my car insurance. I'm probably not going to switch. I have my homeowner's insurance. I'm limited to what I can use anyway because I live in the stupid state of Florida, but where the weather's beautiful. You know, I'm probably, you know, I'm probably, I don't need a whole lot of fast casual dining, but I do eat some, you know, so that may work for me. Um, you know, so you always want to kind of you know, try to stay away from carpet bombing and try to go, you know, targeted niche marketing. And, uh, you know, it's really important. That was very good, by the way, Tay. I like that. Uh, Tay, uh, Trey, uh, we have Trey in the front, uh, ready for a question for you. All right, Trey, it's all you, babe. So <clears throat> with such little number of um, surveys being taken like relative to the numbers that you were putting out, how are you guys able to um, like give such specific numbers when it comes to like, um, I don't know, it just says like in the top, in the top left corner, 18,165, 18 million. Like, how are you able to get that specific of a number? Sure. So 
we are collecting a rep what we believe is a represent a representative sample of the United States population 13 years and older. So from there, we use what they call a weighting algorithm to say, you know, by age, here's how the weighting goes. By ethnicity, here's how the weighting goes. So let's say, for instance, we know, let's say that 17% of um, Americans 13 years and older are African American. Well, then our collection will reflect by weight 13% times, you know, um, you know, so we want to make sure that we are gro you know, a lot of people use the word weighting. You can also use the word grossing up. So, you know, I may only have, let's say, 430 people that responded that they are, you know, well, let's see if I had 6,500 and 1,700. I can't do the math that fast in my head. So let's just say I have 65, uh, 650 responses that are African American. I then distribute those based on my other um, parameters and then determine my weights that way. We also have what they call a minimum sample size. My minimum sample size is 30. If I get down below 30 responses, I will not record that number because it is not reliable. So we know from statistical and Dr. Bishop, I, I don't necessarily want to get into that deep of a science sort of thing, but mm -hmm. we know from using some statistical formulas. And by the way, these formulas, I did not originally, neither one of us, Dr. Bishop nor I came up with these. These are in books. You know, I know the difference. You know, the interesting thing is I did a sample size of almost 6,500. But you know what? I could have collected 5,000 and had the same accuracy as the 6,500. So bigger is not always better. Better is how the sample is created and how the sample is built. But we have a minimum sample size of 30. And we have, uh, you know, we've tested our weighting formulas and our weighting algorithms out pretty extensively. So I feel pretty confident you know, in what we're doing. But, you know, again, you know, Trey, it's always about looking at the data. And it's also, if you don't know, don't be afraid to ask. You've got somebody in the back of the room, your professor who's very knowledgeable. Say, hey, Professor Bishop, I found this data, but here's where I found it. Do you think that, you know, this is reliable or do you think maybe I should steer clear of it? Or send it to me if you want. That's Did that answer the question? Yeah. Yes, sir. And then just to add to that, right, I mean, that's that's the goal of the representative sample is to essentially get responses that are consistent with the entire population so they can be grossed up or scaled up or whatever in a kind of, it's inexact, right, because we're talking about what is, what is the, you know, exact breakdown of 150 million people. We're not saying that we, these numbers are 100% spot on to the right. To the it's trends, it's this general group is represented enough in the sample so that we can say what they're saying is consistent enough for the entire population. And that's what a representative sample is. It's, it is complicated to get that figured out from it is. the research methodology side of things. And, and just to back that up, I also tell people all the time, don't just rely on one data source. You know, look for data sources that will confirm or refute what it is that you're seeing. I realize you may not have as much time as you need to do a lot of that. But again, you know, how long does it take to Google, you know, NFL social media usage? You know, it doesn't take long at all. You know, so you could compare, let's say, something else that's out there. And I'm sure there's a column professor somewhere that has done a research paper on this. And you can look up their numbers. Now, again, their numbers may be older. Their numbers may be calculated a different way there. But... It's just going to give you, you want to fill up that information funnel. When it comes to filling up the funnel, more is better. But the good stuff hopefully drips down into the page. Yeah. But the funnel needs to be full in order for that to happen. And when you were actually writing up or preparing presentations on this, you then include, at, well, at least on the academic side, what we call a limitation section, where you say there are some limits to the data here. We recognize that this, this may not properly scale for a variety of reasons. There may not be statistical significance and a whole bunch of concepts that are beyond the scope of this course. But 
everyone understands that we're doing a representative sample, there's some gap, there, there's some inexactitude in it. Uh, it, it's, we can't say for sure with a 6,500 person sample that we are capturing the exact perfect number of 150 million, but yes, yes. we've got numbers that we can show trends. We can show, you know, aggregate numbers and well, you know, for instance, that Penn State information, right? We don't know if it's 1.2 million or 1.3 or 1.4 based on the sample size. Maybe we do have a little more hammered down than that. There's there's some slippage there, but the point is the broader numbers tell us there is a whole heck of a lot of Eagle spans that are Penn State fans. And that's the important piece. Trey, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so he kind of answered it there. Sorry. I, I was just going to ask how, yeah, how, just like, how close right. you think it, the numbers are, but but it's more of just like the big idea. I think that's a great question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. No, absolutely. Look, you're working with data. You know, these are all the kinds of questions you should be asking and you should be understanding. And you know what? Look, you know, data can go two ways with you. It can be boring as hell or it can be fun as hell. Um, for me, it's always fun. It's always fun, um, but you know that's just me. And, and, and there's something else they want to bring in. Yeah, other questions. Yeah. And, and we and, and the point is, you can look at the methodology. You can kind of intuit. Yes. The more you look at surveys like this, the more you begin to sniff out when something's amiss. And, and it, it, it's kind of an art that you develop over time. But that's why we start you with data, like what SBR Net does, where we can say definitively. Hey, you know, we're, we're not 100% perfectly on the nose for hundreds of millions of people, but we are really darn close because you know, that was what I did when I first analyzed SBR Net's data was I looked at their methodology and I said, okay, do they have the, the standard concepts in here about, uh, you know, having a representative sample and things like that? And, and, and so you always look at those things. Sorry, just to jump in. Uh, no problem. You got a thought or were you ready or I didn't mean to make uh, no. There you go. You're ready. Uh, is there like a correlation on? people who gamble on college sports as compared to people who uh, gamble on like NFL sports, I mean, on the NFL teams, sorry. Um, is there a correlation? Yeah. People that gamble, gamble. Um, right. <laughs> I don't know the percent of people that gamble on college versus, um, you know, NFL off the top of my head. Um, but people that gamble tend to gamble. The biggest limitations though on gambling in many cases are one, if the state that the majority of the people live in actually have online gambling, you know, online, like you guys are in Ohio, I don't think, yeah, you know what? I think January 1st. Online, it's okay. coming. All right. So they're, they're, they're coming up, you know, it's coming up. So right now, is it limited to brick and mortar? Can you go into like one of the tribal casinos, let's say in place of bet, do they, they have a uh, brick and mortar sports books? Uh, no, I haven't been to one of the casinos in Ohio recently, so I'm not sure if they have books here or not. Yeah, um, I'm not sure either. But again, you want to make sure two things. Number one, where is the where is the team, where is the school located? How is their fan base distributed? Um, if their fan base is distributed, let's say, in a region of the country where there doesn't happen to be that many states, there's about 23 states right now that have uh, legalized online sports betting. So, you know, that's a little bit of a nuanced question. What's your first name? Uh, Lance, Lance, there's a little bit, that's a little bit of a nuanced question. Um, I, you know, there is a report that I did, by the way, put into your, uh, into the Dropbox folder. So I'm going to give uh, Dr. Bishop, Professor Bishop, a heads up. It's this one. So let me, uh, of course, I went to the wrong spot. But this report is a really interesting report. And here's the reason why I love it. So I had this one made up special. This was just made up for me. But I went to what they call fan activities in here. Now, this is a little different. What we're looking at here are multiple years of data on one spreadsheet. So I've got both 20 and 21. So let's ask, let's answer, let's answer Lance's question. So we know from sports gambling, if we look at college, that 15,795,000 people gamble on sports that are also college football fans but there are 22 million 582 million that gamble who are nfl fans 
So you can then what I would do is look at, let's say, the growth. Well, you know what? College football hasn't necessarily, oh, maybe I just lied on that one. It grew a lot. Did it? Where's college football? So college football went from 12,289,000 fans up to 15,795,000. Whereas the NFL. I think that's uh, from, college basketball, Mr. Sports. Oh, was it? Oops. My bad. Sorry about that. So football went from 15 million fans in 2020 to basketball, football. Where's the football? It's just uh, you're, it's right beneath your point. There you go. Up to 18 million fans. So, you know, you calculate that growth number, just a simple division. You know, and then you do the same thing with NFL football. We know, for instance, in 2020 that 19 million 523 were gambling on NFL football. That number's up to 22 million now. Calculate the net change. So again, you have the ability to be able to look at it, you know, in a variety of different ways. You can look at it at a variety of different, uh, you know, data points, but it will always tell you, you know, what you need to know in terms of where the growth is, where the opportunities are. So we can see that correlation, right, between uh, college and NFL. And, and then the next question would be, you know, and this would be more of a, you know, a follow-up would be how many of those college football fans are also gambling on, on the NFL? If that was the big data you were trying to capture, that question would need to be built into the survey. I'm not sure if that yes. big one was, was asked, but it is. That, would be, that would be the way you'd go about it. And the interesting thing, I, I know uh, Mr. Schwartz and I were talking about this yesterday, Gamblers for me are people that are um, tough to think that they give you the exact right answers all the time and are being completely honest and forthright. I know I think I mentioned this before, but I think gamblers are prone to uh, underestimating, under understating their losses and over exaggerating their wins. And so uh, this is a situation where when we're dealing with the data uh, a population like gamblers, we're going to be a little extra scrutinous on their responses and be looking for you know, how we can make sure they're getting valid and reliable responses, but that, that's an aside. Look, it, you know, Dr. Bishop or Professor Bishop is right. You know, I, I have done my share of sports gambling over the years, and, you know, I will never give people the accurate number for what I've lost, but I will always exaggerate what I won. So just FYI. I, and let me tell you, it's very odd that the House doesn't win. I think the only person that that's really come into play with has been Donald Trump. Um, in New Jersey specifically, and I'm not sure if you're a Trump fan or not, or your general politics, but as a general rule, casinos don't go out of business. Mm -hmm. There's a reason. And there's a reason why. Those facilities, yeah. And there's a reason why. And if you've never been to Vegas, there's a reason why they keep building bigger and more, because it, the house always wins. And they are running a lot of data themselves to make sure oh, yeah. that that is, in fact, the case. They have got these numbers down to a science where, you know, for instance, blackjack, you might think it's a pretty straight up game. But the, the house, I believe, has something like a 52 percent advantage to 48 percent advantage. So over time, they're relying on, hey, we, we might lose in the short run. There might be someone comes in that gets hot. But over time, the statistics are going to show that they're going to be profitable. So they rely on that stuff. Outlier, somebody has to win. Somebody has to win. Yeah, well, exactly. If no one you know won, no one would go. <laughs> you know what? It's 902. Um, I don't yeah. want to take up much more time. Uh, are there any last minute questions? Uh, well, right, well, I think that we've gotten a, a lot of great information today, and hopefully I, uh, that was really helpful for everybody. We can we show appreciation here. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks for your questions. Good information. Uh, Dr. Bishop, I sent you the link to the Dropbox folder where the additional data is located. Please feel free right. to get, you know, uh, get it to everyone and let them uh, you know, you, you know, put it up on the screen and maybe work with it a little bit. Will do. What do you think? Do we feel like the class is on track, Mr. Schwartz? Are they asking the right questions? Yeah, I think they are. And I, I think so too. too. I think so I think too. We're are. exactly where we yeah. need to be. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. One second here, we will.